in television and outside broadcasts, the camera, cameramen point and frame the shots, but they do not expose the camera. The camera exposure and colour matching is done from within the OB truck, and in this vehicle, the two positions either side, the engineers operating there will adjust the exposure of the camera. And which is the, the iris in the it, camera. Which is the iris. And you needed to expose within perhaps a quarter of a stop to be, because you're not just exposing an, a camera, you're, you're matching all of them together, which is obviously more critical than just an individual one with no comparison. And then in the middle here, we've got a colour balance panel for each camera in use, and you've got red, green and blue knobs, because they're the three primary colours in, te in television and lighting. And you've got the dark controls for the dark bits of the picture, which are called lift, and gains for the bright bits of the picture. So if you want to, um, to adjust, uh, uh, if, it, if the picture's looking a bit cold, i.e. blue, um, in the brighter areas, you may take a bit of blue gain down and increase the red gain to compensate. And that's a process of continuous adjustment throughout the entire program for each and every camera. So it's a busy time, especially if you're outdoors in a, with nice fluffy white cumulus clouds going in front of the sun, you'll get at least three stops change in exposure and you'll try to hit a target of quarter of a stop and you'll get a big change of colour in, at the same time. In modern terms, it's probably what's considered grading, so this is yeah. live grading. The human eye can cope with a contrast ratio of 500 to 1. These cameras can only cope with 30 to 1, so we've got to constantly help. And that's why it needs individuals like us to decide on what the viewer at home wants to look at. So we're constantly having to ride that all the time. And we'll come onto the golfs. If somebody tees off at a golf course, the golf ball takes off from a fairly dark tee shot, goes into the air against a bright sky. If we don't do our job properly, in other words, stop the camera down sufficiently, the cameraman hasn't got a chance of following the ball all the way from when it leaves the club head to when it lands on the ground again. You had to anticipate that as well, because yeah. um, there, there's a delay between you adjusting and the, the camera actually responding. And so once, once you had gone into the sky, you immediately start to stop down, because you've got to go from one end of the, uh, the knob to the other. Uh, and you don't want to overdo it either, because when it comes down again, then suddenly all the blacks are a bit crushed and you wouldn't see the ball again. So you've got to bring it back up again. So you, it, 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 that was the, uh, uh, probably one of the most skillful yes. uh, pieces, yeah. you know, that, that, the difficult OBs really to deal with as far as exposure was concerned. Luckily, the players being professionals, you could judge where the ball was going to land. So if they did lose it in the air, you made a pretense just ease out. and then sort of go down to the ground, pull out wide, and one of the comments said, oh, it's on that knoll over there where previous shot went sort of thing. So you get away with it from that respect, but more often than not, you would have to try and help the cameraman as much as possible. And if you had a very good cameraman and a competent racks operator together, the cameraman would zoom in very tight on the ball as it went up, but he utterly relied on the racks operator exposing it properly so it, it was invisible, and he would then hang on to it, and the very best cameraman had got a ball that was you know, a quarter of the size of the picture right through the sky. But only a small number of them were sharp enough to do that, and it was a team game. And going back to the shadows, there were several well-known locations that got their own sort of names and, and were well known for difficulties at different times of the day. There was a very well-known Twickenham shadow where half the grandstand shadowed the pitch. And until even quite recently, the centre court and number one court at Wimbledon had very difficult conditions late afternoon, early evening, very, very difficult. So this is where it's black on one side because of the shadow yeah. and it's white on the other. Well, it's, it's uh, green well, on the other if it's grass. Uh, and if you've got a player who's kicking the ball across this shadow, then you've got to make sure that you can see not only the ball, but also his face 
So it's a judgment thing. And then when he kicks it the other way, it, it would be overexposed, so it'd just be a white ball. Uh, and the grass would all be almost white. So you've got to then stop it down. But then you've got to know that, is he going to kick it that way or not? And, and it, 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 there's a, an awful lot of, of judgment, which is, and we were engineers, we were trained as engineers. And the difference is, we, were, we now were becoming operational engineers. Which is More a, a artists, sort of in a way. Breed, yeah, breed, yeah. yeah. Of course, if it, if, if, you, if it went wrong, there was a, a shout on production talk back, you know, camera one, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think one of the areas that we've had a lot of problems is when we had long cable runs across places like golf course or up mountains, the cable was supplied in 200 foot lengths maximum. And these PC-80 cameras were eventually modified so they would run up on up to 5,000 feet of this which is 25 sections. And this is a 101-way cable. So there is considerable scope for the odd fault to appear. Of course, on a programme as well, we, we weren't using the amount of cameras they use nowadays. I'm told that they use 28 <coughs> cameras on a, on a big football match. If this was doing a big football match in those days, it would be five cameras. And then if we wanted more cameras on a golf, they would join scanners together. So we, <coughs> on a golf, there may be four scanners in different areas of, yep. of uh, the, the course. And the cost of some of the early equipment was remarkably high. We got the first ever handheld colour radio cameras into Britain, developed by CBS in North America and then made by Philips. And in Britain, they converted one from the American standard to the British PAL standard. And the BBC got two of these initially, and the cameras and their base stations cost $200,000 in 1969. These, these vehicles were about £300,000 when they were built. Now, you could buy a house for seven, £8,000 then, but 300000 for the, gives you some the vehicle. Idea, really. Put in perspective. Which, which is part of the reason that we only got four or five cameras and that the spare was precious and was swapped between vehicles because it, it really was capital intensive. Uh, but even 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 though it was all uh, it was you know a long ago, we never lost an OB, as far as I can remember. Yeah. Never, we never ever lost, lost an OB. We always we, made the deadline. We always made the yeah. deadline. I mean I've been on big on programmes along the way where we've had generators stop on us and we've had to get stuff back together and operational and on one occasion we got power back on the trucks at Silverstone 12 laps before the end of the Grand Prix. Uh, no pressure. <laughs> that is our job, is what we call first line maintenance in that we can find other ways around the problem if need be. Because of these trucks being so flexible there's you can bypass systems or re-plug it if something goes faulty. And that's the skill of our job, really. Yeah. We're not there changing components. We couldn't do that. We haven't got the, um, the spares or the, the equipment time. all the time. time. Yeah. But it was just yeah. get it working. I think the other thing is that the, the, the vehicles were um, designed to have a spare of anything that was really important, like a pulse generator, um, which you, you can't run without a pulse generator. Um, so we'd have two of those. Um, and we had sufficient spares of cameras. So as well as having a CCU like that, we'd have a certain amount of spare boards as well, which we could swap if necessary. So it was designed knowing that things will break down and it was it really, as you said, really it, it was designed to be overplugged and changed. And, yeah. Uh, we would carry a, even a spare set of camera tubes, yeah. the red, green, and blue tubes, because often they would fail, and we may well have to change them in not very good environment, i.e., upper tubes, rostrum, so. in rain or whatever. And you're trying to keep these things clean, scrupulously dust-free. Uh, and it might be pouring with rain. And some directors sort of say, well, why can't I see this camera? Well, we're just changing the tube on it. But that was a major task. Yeah. It was, but we did do it. Yes, yes. I've had to change a tube up a rostrum uh, on a race course in the rain, but... With cold was, fingers. <laughs> it, uh, it was not the thing to do. You could possibly help it, because they're so expensive. 
I mean, you'd, you'd have your nostrils wrapped if you, if you broke a pin off a tube. And it's just, it's like putting a valve in a, in a radio set, you know, except it's very fiddly and not the thing, really, it should really be done on a bench, but we, we did it if we had to, to get it going. Well, this, it, this, this was the, the height of the technology at the time. It, um, it was the first major, I mean, there had been experimental uh, colour uh, scanners, but this was a, the, the, these were purpose built and they were the first generation. And I worked on this individual one. <laughs> and there so, were, this is CMCR9. I worked initially as the second supervisor on CMCR1 and accepted 7 and 8, which are the predecessors to this. And the last truck I worked on, I think, was CMCR 63. So there's a lot of progress over the years.